Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast that delivers cutting-edge food as medicine solutions for optimal health. Allie Miller is a nutrition expert sought out by the media and America's top medical institutes for her revolutionary functional medicine interventions. From disease treatment to prevention, every episode will empower you with ways to put yourself back in control of your health. Please note, the topics discussed are for educational purposes only. Now welcome, Integrative Dietitians Allie Miller and her co-host Becky Yu. Welcome to the Naturally Nourished Podcast. You are joining us for episode 269, where we are taking a deeper dive into CGMs or continuous glucose monitors with a guest, Kara Collier from NutriSense. In today's episode, we will be taking a detailed approach on the four pillars of blood sugar balance, how stress, diet, movement, and sleep impact your blood sugar and where this might be hindering your wellness and weight loss goals. Yes. In today's episode, we also talk about the importance of blood sugar variability or how your blood sugar levels shift and fluctuate throughout the day. And this really gives us that empowering information of understanding how our body responds to those four pillars mentioned, and really the idea that you can have a healthy, low risk, non-diabetic optimal a one C, but still be driving oxidative stress and inflammatory processes from irregularity and dynamic spiking throughout the day. Yes. Really good point. And we will dive into that for sure. Um, episode 209 was the last time that we really talked about CGMs. Um, so that was 60 episodes ago now. So I think there will be some new goodies over a year, um, for sure some new goodies to unpack within today's episode. Yes. And in 209, we really talked a little bit more logistics on what a CGM is, as well as specifically my information. I think we unpacked 10 days of my data and really went deep dive on four of them. We talked about how I even like challenged metabolic flexibility Mm -hmm. with uh, sweet potato fries and part of a milkshake. And then how ultimately stress was my biggest driver of blood sugar irregularity. So if you're interested in this concept, check out episode. 209, but we're going to go ahead and jump into things with our opening sponsor. And then we will read Kara's bio and let her onto the show. Cause she's got a lot of cool stuff to share. Yes. Let's so, have a word from fond our opening sponsor. All right. So y'all know that we are big fans of fond and that's why we enjoy talking about them all of the time because they're staples in each of our households as well. They are truly wellness well-made and they provide the powers of bone broth providing important amino acids like L-glutamine to aid in gut integrity, healing that leaky gut, reducing allergens and sensitivities while aiding in supporting a healthy, robust immune response. We also get compounds like glycine which can aid in body fat metabolism and also as an anxiolytic as glycine can aid in GABA formation. So we have seen in individuals that will use bone broth therapeutically to even support blood sugar metabolism by aiding in that immune response, as well as less inflammatory food response and in support for stress regulation. So fond really takes things next level. They are super high quality from the way that they cook to the way that they seal in their iconic glass jars. Everything is produced in stainless steel vats, no plastic in the process. They partner with local farmers for quality produce. They use organic chicken and grass fed beef as their sourcing for their bones. And then they even take it next level by creating synergy of whole food ingredients that not only taste absolutely amazing, like a sushi in a jar. Uh, but this also plays a big role in optimizing nutrient density and ingredients that play well together to really support best health outcomes. So go on over to fondbonebroth.com slash Allie Miller RD, or you can use the code Allie Miller RD at checkout and you will save on your purchase. I highly suggest getting at least a couple four packs. And as we've discussed on our bone broth fasting episode, you can consume three to four jars in a day as a simple approach to bone broth fasting. And it's a great way to keep you on track through the holiday season and maybe offset some of those seasonal indulgences by resetting with a once a week bone broth fast. So you can go on over to fondbonebroth.com slash Allie Miller RD. All right, let's read Karen's bio and then we'll bring her on. 
Kara Collier is a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and certified nutrition support clinician with a background in clinical nutrition, nutrition technology, and entrepreneurship. After becoming frustrated with the traditional healthcare system, she helped start the company NutriSense, where she is now a co-founder and the director of nutrition. Kara is the leading authority on the use of continuous glucose monitoring, CGM technology, particularly in non-diabetics for the purposes of health optimization, disease prevention, and reversing metabolic dysfunction. Hey, Kara, welcome to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Hey, Allie, happy to be here. Awesome. Well, we are happy to have you on here. We recorded a CGM episode more than a year ago. And, uh, we have had so much fun playing with NutriSense CGMs in clinic with one-on-one patient care, as well as in our next level keto program. We've now done a couple rounds of that. And we do that in a fun kind of troubleshooting hot seat style where we let our participants share screenshots of their trends and troubleshoot, but we're really excited to hear from kind of an inside scoop on what NutriSense is up to and the types of problems that you you help direct consumers troubleshoot. So I think it'll be a fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So let's just kick off. Um, you know, we've given our perspective on this, but I would love to ask you why use a CGM? Yeah. Great question to start with. So I I think first to understand why a CGM is so important for a wide audience and not just the traditional use case in diabetics, we first have to understand why glucose is important for everyone to pay attention to. Um, You know, I'm sure your audience is particularly aware of this, but for many people, when they're thinking about tracking or monitoring glucose, they're just thinking about whether they have diabetes or not. And it's so much more than that. You know, I always describe glucose as a vital sign. So just like heart rate, or blood pressure, it fluctuates throughout the day, depending on what you're eating, how much you're moving, how much you might not be moving, sleep quality, quantity, stress levels. And so it's kind of like this um, metabolic parameter where for once, you know, when you're really tracking glucose in and out, you're kind of pulling the curtain back and seeing how the metabolic system is running. So kind of this cellular engine we have, and it either can be powerfully transformative and help us feel our best fuel our energy, or it could be degenerative, right? And it can really slow us down and cause a bunch of uh, downstream effects all the way from energy levels, inflammation, aging, to then the more commonly related um, chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, um, all of those different glucose related or metabolic health related chronic conditions. So if you understand how important glucose is as a metric, then CGM is kind of the next step up where just like it sounds, it's measuring your glucose continuously. So rather than maybe annual labs that you get from a physician or you're ordering, um, or maybe daily finger pricks that you might be checking, you're getting this kind of movie view of your glucose levels. And this helps us to understand the true patterns that our glucose is having. It's not just kind of a snapshot here and there, but it is a movie of what's happening. And this helps us to understand information. You just really wouldn't be able to know unless you're getting that nature of continuous data. So what's happening while you're sleeping? What is the exact glucose curve after a meal? Not just kind of maybe if you checked it an hour or two two hours after you might miss the peak value or the shape of that glucose curve, um, kind of the nuances of fasted glucose, as I'm sure you have both experienced one morning, you could have a high fasted glucose, but it could be kind of a one-off where you've got a poor night of sleep, or you're really stressed out, or you ate really late the night before, but seeing kind of those overall trends, it's just much easier to pick up that information when you're getting that continuous snapshot. And then you're not able to, um, kind of hide from what's happening or miss it, whether it's intentional or not, yes. you're really getting that full insight. We always say that. And it's, it's kind of like one of those conversations of again, empowerment, because we've seen on both ends of the spectrum. One, it's not like a food diary because you can't omit any information. It's watching all of the time. And of course, entering your food in makes more valuable data, but you are getting that ongoing surveillance or accountability in that sense. But also on the other end of the spectrum, We also tell people, and often many see, especially those that have been doing some form of nutritional ketosis and are pretty metabolically flexible, that 
a lot of them have a lot more carbohydrate threshold or tolerance than they perceive, you know? And so it can also liberate you versus be something that's just going to be surveying you and restricting you or taking something else away. Absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, most people come to us and they're like, well, I'm a little nervous. or I was hesitant to try this because I don't want to have to remove all my favorite foods. And a lot of time it's the opposite. It's, oh, I do have some space for these things I love and I enjoy, or there is more flexibility than I thought. You know, I don't have to be strict keto a hundred percent of the time. Um, so yeah, I've seen the same exact thing where it can be two extremes, you know, sometimes we do have to cut back a little bit and find a more happy medium of where your carbohydrate threshold is. But a lot of times we're allowing a more liberal diets than somebody might have anticipated, which can be really freeing for people. Totally. And that was Allie and I experienced for sure wearing it, that we noted more metabolic flexibility. Um, and even within that, some nuance, I think of, of the carbohydrate choices that work best for your body. So like rice and sweet potatoes for me worked really well. Whereas coconut water was like an off the charts glucose spike mm -hmm. where I'm like, that might be a food sensitivity actually. Yeah. Have you seen any trends of that, of inflammatory foods? I've seen the same with apples for mm -hmm. one individual. And then they ended up having, you know, an MRT high inflammatory response to that ingredient. Do you see blood sugar trends yeah. with inflammation yeah. and, and food sensitivity or even inflammatory response in the sense of allergy in foods? Absolutely. Yeah. We've seen something similar. It was one of my first clients. I always remember because I, we were just like racking our brains of what could be happening because he was having a glucose response, nothing huge, but still, you know, 20 point jump from macadamia nuts, which is, you know, like the mm -hmm. iconic keto nut. Um, and so we were like, what is going on? And then he did get some food sensitivity testing and macadamia nuts were off the charts. So um, able to put that piece of the puzzle together. But we we do see that of people just having sensitivities or um, intolerance, kind of that inflammatory response where somebody else is tolerating that food really well. And it might be something that is very nutrient dense. And for majority of the people out there, it's it's a great choice, but uh, the devil is in the details, right? It's someone's super how, someone else's kryptonite. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're, and I think that's why this tool is so powerful really for two reasons. One is that just unique bio-individuality, you know, how you, between the three of us, we're all dietitians. I'm sure we all try fairly well to practice what we preach. Although I'm, I'm sure we can, I can speak for myself. It's not always perfect, but, um, the three of us though, are not going to respond the exact same to the exact same foods. Right. And that's where it's just fascinating, you know, before measuring this, one of our best tools for how we might predict someone's glucose response is glycemic index. Uh, you know, it's just kind of a, a scale one to a hundred of how you might right. respond to foods. And what we have seen is there's just really not a good tool for an individual. It's good at a population level yes. when we've averaged everyone out, but there's so many people outside of that average that just don't fit in, uh, where, you know, for an example, myself, one of my lowest glucose responses to fruit, when I've tried a bunch of different um, types of fruit, one of my lowest responses is bananas, which is a very high glycemic index is, was really surprising to me, but I, I have a very minimal response to bananas. Um, whereas something like that might be a lower glycemic index fruit, I have a higher response to. So, uh, for some reason, you know, we just have this unique response. A lot of it we're assuming or, or kind of estimating from the research that's out there is related to differences in microbiome, probably epigenetics, genetics. I'm sure we're going to uncover more factors that are determining this. Um, but it is very interesting how different we all are at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think it takes that next level of this, you know, individualized optimal eating or food as medicine approach beyond, right? Like what fits your macros. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you, know, yeah. so you could have a perfect low glycemic protocol or plan and set macros and eating within your pie wheel. But that's what, then you get to learn with a CGM specific food choice within those macros and even take it kind of next level. Um, within your banana thing, I'm curious. So did you have still a blood sugar spike and just a more favorable insulin response or the whole, let's talk a little bit about blood sugar variability and, um, you know, what blood sugar variability tells us, as you mentioned, you know, we, classically as I'm a certified diabetes educator and, you know, the classic training is looking at one hour and two hour postprandials, which would be selective finger sticks. Let's talk about kind of the variability and the relationship of shift over the time of eating and what more information we can get with the CGM and why that matters. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we're thinking about when we're eating and how our glucose is responding after a meal, this is where most of our variability comes from. Although of course, glucose can kind of fluctuate from non food related items as well, such as, you know, stress or, um, injury, but most of the time it's from a meal. And really what we're looking for is a few different components. We want to see first, how high does your glucose go at any point in time? Mm -hmm. And as you're probably aware from the classic diabetes training, this isn't even necessarily something we're usually looking for, or usually, you know, kind of in the classic sense, looking at that two hour, um, postprandial number. Uh, but that peak glucose value is very important because we know that the higher your glucose is going typically above a 140 threshold. So we have a higher risk at 160, 180, 200. We're seeing that inflammatory response. Um, that can be an independent risk factor for endothelial damage. Um, that can be an independent risk factor for oxidative stress. Uh, so we want to see what that peak value is. And for a non-diabetic aiming for 140 is kind of that upper ceiling is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, if your glucose is running higher, of course, you know, we can, we can make a different uh, goal for you to reach for first. And then the second thing we really want to look at is that recovery, which is kind of the more traditional metric of two hours after a meal, have you come back down to baseline. So we typically like to see either you around hundred or less two hours later, or kind of close to what your pre-meal glucose value was. Uh, we see majority of people who are pretty metabolically flexible, insulin sensitive, will be able to recover within that two to three hour window. And then the other thing to think about is just how big of a jump your glucose had. So maybe your glucose was at 70 before you ate and it jumped to 135, which is under the 140 threshold. And then maybe it went back to 70 at two hours, but that's a pretty big shift in glucose, yeah. you know, 7135 by the other metrics is good, but that's a big jump. Uh, so we really want to stick to what we just call it a Delta, you know, the change in glucose of 40 or less, ideally sometimes 30, um, can be a better metric to aim for. So instead of 70 to 135, you know, 70 to hundred would be a little bit more, um, of a kind of a, a lower glycemic variability. And then we can kind of take a zoomed out look at variability and just look at the 24 hour trend, not just in a meal window. And in our app, what we kind of capture variability with a standard deviation. So, you know, it's just capturing how many, how big of a swing are you having from your average? Um, and what we know from the diabetes literature is that a high glycemic variability, a lot of swings can actually create more oxidative stress and inflammation than just sustained high glucose levels, which is really interesting. Um, so even if it's coming from food or maybe via variability for other purposes, we want to keep um, it within a semi-tight range. So standard deviation in our app, we're looking for 14 or less. Um, you know, that's, that's a good metric for a non-diabetic to reach for, but a caveat to that is that doesn't mean that your glucose has to be a flat line. So this is a common misconception as well that, uh, we really like to emphasize. Cause I think there are a lot of people in this space kind of indicating like the, the flatter your glucose is the better. It's okay to have some variability. If you are including a little bit of carbohydrates in your meals, um, we expect it to go up. I always say if you were wearing a continuous lipid monitor and you didn't want that, you wanted that to be flat too, then suddenly we would have nothing to eat. Right. Uh, but we don't want giant glucose swings. We want to see it recover and in insulin sensitivity. Uh, but some fluctuation at appropriate times is just, is just that, you know, it's appropriate. It's physiologically normal. Uh, but we, we want to keep it within a healthy range. Got it. We tend to look for more like a 20 to 30 As we say, point we're harsh, variability. We're, we're, we're pretty <laughs> aggressive and harsh. And a lot of our clients are already, you know, have been keto for quite some time. Yeah. Um, but I know within our own data too, that was kind of like our goals for ourselves of, of that 20 point Delta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And interestingly, a lot of people will start to learn like when they feel best. Um, mm -hmm. like I've had people tell me, I, you know, I just, I get brain fog or I feel cruddy. If my glucose goes above 120. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have literature to suggest that that is a threshold, but for that individual, that's how they feel. You know, they're 
um, have an enhanced mind body connection when they're seeing the data and comparing it to how they feel. And same with kind of the shift in glucose at, at mealtime. You know, some people will say if it's more than 20, I get jittery or, you know, I get a little bit of a slump afterwards and, and all of those subjective experiences are legitimate too. So I do think there's also a little bit of variability in how some people experience the changes in glucose. Yeah. And some people might feel a little bit more sensitive to that, which is something to pay attention to as well. Totally. And, and the beauty of wearing one of these monitors to begin with that you can start to understand and, and unpack those trends in yourself. Um, let's talk more about, you mentioned that, um, glucose can go up for other reasons beyond, you know, what you're putting into your body. So beyond food, um, let's talk maybe about the impact of stress. I know Allie has an example in, um, episode 209, where she talks about, blood sugar going up to 144 absent of any food. I think you were like totally fasted that afternoon. Um, and it was just a particularly stressful day. So I'd love to talk about, um, that trend and, and maybe best, um, ways that you've seen to mitigate that stress. Yeah, absolutely. And we always say that there are four core pillars of good glucose management. There are a lot of other factors that can affect glucose, but there are four big ones, um, nutrition, physical activity, stress, and sleep. Um, so all of these are equally important and they're going to have just as much of a pronounced effect as the other. So a lot of people just think about food, you know, they're like, how many carbohydrates am I going to eat the right. sugar? Uh, but stress is equally important. And we see this all the time where people have acute spikes in glucose from stress, but also kind of a baseline elevated glucose level when they're stressed. So, um, I'm sure, you know, you've kind of touched on the mechanisms here, but, uh, we do have a normal stress response that acute stress response is normal, but when we're stressed, we're going to have that surge of cortisol, that surge of adrenaline, and that's essentially stimulating the processes in our body that are going to release glucose, whether that's creating new glucose or, um, breaking down our glycogen stores. And then we're going to see that spike in glucose. So, a lot of people will see this if they are, you know, stressed at work, maybe they're reading a stressful email, or if they're commuting and they're in a traffic jam, or they're having a argument with their spouse, we'll see this glucose spike. And sometimes um, it can be, you know, the biggest variability they have all day, which is what it sounds like you experience. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did have, I did break my fast, I think around like noon that day. And my blood sugar variability during the meal was like a 10, cause it was just like eggs and hot sauce and avocado and microgreens or something. So really limited there, but it was this classic end of the day. My daughter's coming home from school. I'm behind on my patient charts. And I always feel this surge of adrenaline. That's like mm -hmm. that, you know, proverbial elephant on the chest, you know, the, the situation of high stress demand. Um, and it was to me very validating to be like, Whoa, if you don't recalibrate this, you know, of course I brought in my, uh, GABA calm and we have our whole line of, of, uh, supplements within our naturally nourished line, but I had missed two of my calm and clear. It was, it was just the perfect storm. And it was very yeah. validating to see, okay, like this is the legit element of stress kills, you know, stress can create disease. And I had seen that also in an A1C, I will say, you know, I have some high powered attorneys or people that have taken on a really intense new role and their A1C will go up like 0.6, you know, percent. Um, but I still think seeing the dynamic jags and then again, that experiential data of that's what this feels like, you know, this isn't just in my head. I don't just feel overworked or overburdened. I'm having a physiological dynamic stress response. Um, and that was really empowering for me to work on harnessing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what we commonly see is that for a lot of people, the stress response is either, really hard to quantify. Um, so it's easy to, you know, brush it under the rug, like mm -hmm. you're mentioning, or you're so stressed all the time that normal feels normal. <laughs> and so being able to put some data to that has been a really eye-opening experience for a lot of people. You know, they're, they're like, Oh, you know, I've heard that maybe stress is an issue, or maybe I should do a little bit more relaxation, but it's not that big of a deal. I eat really well. I exercise all the time. And then they see these giant glucose spikes, not just once, but every day, maybe at their noon meeting or yeah. twice a day during yeah. their commute. And they're realizing what, 
impact this is having on their health. And it's a, a wake up moment for a lot of people of, oh, this is real. Um, this is what this feels like. And again, that mind body connection uh, helps put those pieces of the puzzle together of realizing how important it is and what an effect it truly is having on their body. Um, so it can be really helpful for, to put data to that. And yeah. especially if anyone's wearing any additional trackers, it's like two pieces of data together makes it even harder to ignore. Like if you're doing an HRV tracker, um, sure. or even heart rates, putting those together, uh, can, it can really help people do something about it. Um, there's also the chronic stress piece where maybe it's not something like an acute moment where you're feeling that stress, but more kind of a baseline hum. And for a lot of people, we'll see this show up in their overnight glucose values, which yeah. is typically not something you're, you're getting to see unless you're wearing a CGM. So for many people, this is new information. Um, usually, you know, you're sleeping during that time and hopefully not checking your glucose with a glucose meter in the middle of the night. Uh, so we'll see these higher values while people are sleeping and sometimes creep into the morning and lead to those higher fasted glucose values. And that's just that chronic stress response. You know, your liver is pumping out glucose because right. it thinks it needs energy for whatever Running you're stressed about. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't actually have, you know, the demands that our body thinks it needs, you know, we don't need that energy. It's a different type of stressor, our modern day life. And so, uh, that's the other thing we'll, we'll see often, um, is if your diet is relatively, nutrient dense, really carb controlled. And we're seeing those high baseline values. It's usually stress. Yes. And so I do want to just unpack a little bit more here. Um, two things I want to share that I haven't shared since I believe the last time this is since we've done our last CGM episode. Uh, one trend I've seen that's pretty marked is when individuals take time for prayer, Bible study, meditation, um, introspective breath work, uh, that I have seen blood sugar levels actually not just preventing from spiking, but appreciable reductions, like, you know, 10, 15 points of a blood sugar reduction, just like we would see with walking outside after a dinner type thing. So I thought that that was really powerful to see again, this mental, emotional, physiological, on the opposite, right. Where the stress drives it up, but also the, the prayer, meditation, gratitude, mindfulness, vasovagal support with breath work can bring it down. Um, and then I also saw a really cool, you know, during like peak pandemic time, um, an individual, uh, client of mine that lives alone and doesn't have pets. So not a lot of like oxytocin and, and touch and connection. And the one time the blood sugar levels looked the best was during a dance class. And it wasn't a dance class that had a lot of physical activity. I attributed it and I, I'm, I'm nerdy in the world of anxiety with, you know, my, my work and such, but I attributed it, it to that's when this individual was touching another human being. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Whoa. Like that's an oxytocin blood sugar reduction. Um, so I thought that those were two really powerful pieces of the puzzle of, again, when we look at just balanced, optimized lifestyle, these key pillars and really adding a quantitative value to them, both human connection, hugging and touching, as well as a spiritual psychological release. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, there are a lot of different things people can do to try to manage this stress response. And I think different things work for different people, but a, a lot of times it is something like that social connection, um, touch, or just the deep breathing. Like you're mentioning for a lot of people, we'll see highest glucose responses to their lunch meal that they're eating at work because they're eating it quickly in front of their computer while they're reading something stressful. And then they'll eat that same meal on the weekends. And it's a perfectly normal glucose response. And so doing some deep breathing right before you eat, trying to, you know, unplug, remove the devices and pay attention to just the food yeah. you're eating and get in a little bit of more relaxed state before you eat. Yep. yep. And a lot of people prior to maybe having the data wouldn't necessarily take that recommendation as seriously yeah. as when you have the data and it's like, no, this isn't woo woo. This is real. And this is how we can help mitigate it. And it helps a lot of people just even a, a couple seconds to take those deep breaths or to stand outside with your feet in the grass or get some sun on your face. And then, you know, take it, take a breather, take a break. Those little things throughout the day can make a really big difference. Yeah. So when you are helping on, you know, a coaching level with individuals, 
what are the, the one, two, three hits? I know everyone's individual, but I'm just curious, like, do you have a general recommendation of a starting point for a supplement strategy for a chronic stressed individual, or do you give one lifestyle, one supplement, or where do we, I don't want to say any words before I let you kind of open up your mind and then. (laughs) Yeah, there's, there's a few things that we try first, typically that seem to work really well. Uh, the first is just kind of the deep breathing. Um, one thing we like to do is, is just teaching people where those triggers can feel physically. So kind of what we do is walk through like three spots. So physically feeling your belly and letting it relax, letting your face relax and letting your chest relax. So when people are feeling moments of stress, so being first aware of when those come. So maybe it is, you know, at work, or as you were saying, right before your daughter gets home, um, just closing your eyes and feeling each of those three areas relax that helps a lot of people. We also really recommend kind of the, the deep breathing, um, the four, seven, eight, I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah. We like that one a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that one seems to stick for a lot of people. We do recommend meditation, but I have found that with meditation, it's, it's one of those things that it's going to work for some people, but not for people either. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of apps out there now, if somebody's some help getting started. Um, but journaling, as you mentioned, kind of that gratitude, taking that five minutes, usually at the beginning of the day, especially for remote workers, I've taken my own advice on this one. Cause it's so easy as a remote worker to just roll out of bed and start, yeah. um, you know, to not have any sort of separation between that adrenaline of kind of starting the day, all the things you have to get done, um, and, and kind of getting into relaxation. So taking five minutes to journal, deep breathe, stretch, um, do some yoga, something like that. So finding a routine, a, a routine that you can stick to, cause then it can help become habitual. Um, when it comes to supplements, you know, if, if we're trying those things and we're still seeing things, uh, not working as well, we, we tend to recommend ashwagandha as kind of a first go-to that seems to be a fairly successful supplement intervention. And I, I'm sure you're knowledgeable in the supplement realm as well of, you know, what your, your top tips might be. That's in our common clear. So for sure, we'd say adaptogens, um, is kind of a first line of defense as well as magnesium. So both of those having kind of that dual impact, right. On blood sugar, but also on stress reduction as well. Yeah. And the other thing that has been really helpful is, um, like prescribing almost outdoor light exposure in that first half of the day, and then being monitoring, uh, light artificial light exposure in the evening. So, uh, those are really helpful for sleep as well, of course, but also just kind of stress, making sure you're going outside at some point in the day if possible. Totally. And especially with like the shift to more remote work, like you mentioned, like for some people that stopped happening because they weren't commuting or walking to work anymore or, um, you know, walking at least from the parking lot or something. So yeah. (laughs) Or even from your bed, maybe. Right. 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 Exactly. And, and, you know, getting off of those devices at night, if we're on them more. So during the day, I think so important as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about the elements of like fasting and meal timing, because I'm sure you have some interesting insights there. Um, what have you learned just about like typical eating patterns and, and anything that's been surprising as you're evaluating clients or, um, you know, made any shifts that seem counterintuitive, told them to fast less fast more. Um, what have you seen in that world? Yeah. 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 One thing that we see pretty universally is kind of that late night eating and how it can have a really pronounced effect on your glucose. So, um, what we know now is that our metabolic, uh, functioning and insulin sensitivity works on our circadian rhythm, just like, you know, the more commonly thought of hormones like melatonin working on a circadian rhythm. So we kind of have our best peak glucose tolerance in the middle of the day. So typically as a good general rule of thumb, I tell people to try to eat during daylight hours and try not to eat when it's dark out. Um, that can be more difficult in the winter months. I'm aware, but that is a good general rule of thumb or aiming for at least three hours of fasting before bed. This is something we really just see across the board is you can have that same exact meal at lunch in the middle of the day and have a great response. And then you could eat it at 8 PM 
as a late dinner and see elevated glucose values all night long. Uh, so we're just not as primed to be metabolizing food, breaking this down, having insulin sensitivity later in the night. And we see this especially pronounced in our shift workers. So, um, we work with a lot of nurses, a lot of MDs that are working in the middle of the night and they'll have their biggest meal at 3 AM and it will be a very dramatic and prolonged glucose response. And then on their off day, they might eat that same exact thing. And it's totally normal, healthy response. So, uh, really being mindful of kind of avoiding that late night snacking late night meals, if possible. Um, it's not always possible. I know for some people to move that dinner meal earlier, if it's the only time you have to be with your family, you know, the only time you have to cook and, and be social. So if you can't have as much control over the time of your last meal, I really recommend making it a lower carbohydrate meal. Um, and if possible, kind of a smaller meal in general, you know, maybe making the meal you have earlier in the day, a little bit bigger, um, and that evening meal, a little bit smaller, if possible, if you're kind of stuck with a 8 PM dinner window. Um, so that's, that's one big one. The other is grazing. You know, I think that we all know mm -hmm. grazing and snacking and the food bites here and there is not good for us, but again, it's helpful to see that with data kind of that little bite here, a little bite there throughout the day for people. Um, it might not cause a dramatic glucose spike, but you're never really getting back into that fasted glucose range, which is then going to cause that 24 hour average to be high. Cause it's just kind of floating up there in the, maybe the low hundreds all day with a, the grazing type of eating pattern. And then the other thing I would say that was really surprising, uh, was just the differences in glucose response we saw with kind of the longer fasting style. So maybe OMAD one meal a day between men and women. Um, so this kind of ties back into the potential stress response again, but something we saw over and over was that men might be able to eat that one meal a day and, and have really good glucose responses. But for the majority of people, uh, women tend to have not as good of a response to that type of eating pattern. Um, especially the healthier a female is the leaner they are, the more they're doing okay. all these. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yes. Which is usually the type of female we're seeing doing the OMAD is the one who's yeah, already right. doing the, the sauna and the, you know, yes. the hit exercise. They're doing all these other things. Yeah. And then they're adding in the one meal a day and maybe they might even be keto. They're not even doing carbohydrates, but we're seeing that really high and prolonged glucose response, you know, poor recovery, high values into the night, which is then an impairing sleep quality. Um, so we were seeing a gender difference with those kind of longer fasting windows, those daily fasting windows. So, um, for some women, most women actually doing at least kind of two meals a day, breaking that up can be really helpful. Yeah. That's generally what we recommend anyway. I think, yeah. uh, and, and I think muscle mass obviously would play into that too. If likely those men had higher muscle yep. mass and so better glucose uptake and utilization versus the women, but, uh, that's generally what we recommend anyway. What about, um, caffeine and, um, kind of what you've seen with that. I know I've troubleshot that with several clients now of, of seeing it, the impact of caffeine. Yeah, we've seen caffeine, um, tend to be pretty variable from person to person. So definitely not a kind of blanket one size fits all approach for some people, really minimal response, glucose response. Um, you know, not, not changing anything or, or responding at all. And for other people, we see a glucose bump or, you know, small spike from caffeine. And again, tying this back to stress response, I, we believe some people are just having a more pronounced stress response to caffeine than yeah. others. Yeah. And most likely, you know, this is probably genetic. Um, we know some people are more caffeine sensitive than others, but, and usually then you can tie that back to subjective feelings, um, that you, that client may not be have been paying attention to before where they're like, Oh, you know, I do feel kind of jittery and kind yeah. of crappy when I drink caffeine, that makes sense. And it usually ties together pretty nicely with the person who doesn't feel that great anyway, is usually kind of having that response, um, of, of, of a jump up and then maybe even a dip afterwards, uh, a little bit more variability from caffeine where other people, you know, one cup or two cups of caffeine a day, and they feel great and their glucose is stable uh, and they might not be as sensitive to it. 
Totally. And again, that's like one of the instances where you can't hide from it. It's like, okay, yep. <laughs> GM told you, you need to break up with coffee. Yeah. We've been talking about this for three months. Yep. Let's <laughs> right. give it like a one month trial <laughs> or that, that yeah. CBD tincture right. that you're adding, you know, 33 milligrams of CBD. I saw that within myself mm-hmm. of doing, you oh, know, totally. black coffee versus coffee with collagen and fat. I mean, cause that's, what's so yeah. funny. I think about using this uh, type of data collection for a two week window is you can spend the first quarter of it really looking at and understanding your trends of your norm. And then, you know, the remaining three quarters of doing ABC testing of, of certain variables. Um, so I think that that really helps. I always suggest individuals make a change for like a consistent three-day window so they can really make sure it's not an anomaly in their data. You know, maybe it wasn't a stressful phone call at work that morning. And it was truly the variable of having the CG, the, excuse me, CBD, the cannabidiol (laughs) in their coffee or not. Um, is, is that kind of how you guys typically approach experiments and changes like three-day windows? Yeah, absolutely. That's what we would recommend is at least repeating it one more time. I like the idea of three, two, just to really verify or else there can be a lot of other moving pieces and you don't want to kind of extrapolate the wrong insights. Um, So at least repeating things once, uh, twice is helpful. And we really recommend first, you know, starting with kind of your regular routine, see what that looks like, and then start the experiments, tweaking and making some changes. Because just like you mentioned, again, the devil is in the detail tells you might respond really well to white rice, but not if you had a poor night of sleep the night before, right. or not if you didn't have time for your morning workout or, Absolutely. you know, the different variables. So there are a lot of um, moving pieces and, and that's kind of the fun part. And that also can be what is liberating. It's, it's not, oh, I can never have rice. It's just right. as long as I get my regular workout in, it's fine, but I know I need to adjust things if I'm in a different schedule, you know, maybe I'm traveling, I didn't have time to work out. I'm going to change the way I'm eating in response to that. And I know it's working because I have this kind of data to back it up rather than, you know, a lot of times we're, we're guessing a little bit, you know, like, I think this is better and it helps people with behavior change of sticking to it. If you're like, yep, I knew this worked and now I will stick to this. I'll do it again. Uh, It really helps solidify that habit. Yes. Yes. We see that, especially with supplements, which is really empowering, you know, like using berberine prior to a meal and seeing the variability there, or again, using our GABA calm or calm and clear, which not just has the ashwagandha, but also has phosphatidylserine, which mitigates cortisol expression. And so I think valuing with quantitative information is, is really key. And then tapping into what that feels like, cause you're not going to wear a CGM all the time, all the time. <laughs> and so, you know, being able to make realistic new patterns, and then you can always reassess those down the line and confirm that that's still appropriate for you. Exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to take a break for our sponsor, which interestingly enough, maybe not so interestingly enough for all you listeners is NutriSense. Um, So I just want to share some specific information about logistics of purchasing a CGM and where you can do so. And then we'll get back into some questions. We're going to cover alcohol and a whole lot more. Um, So as y'all have learned in today's episode already, a continuous glucose monitor or CGM provides you with real time glucose data and each sensor lasts 14 days. NutriSense is unique in the sense that they provide you direct to consumer access to a CGM without a prescription from your practitioner or your medical provider. They also provide you an easy to use app that helps you to combine and visualize your glucose data, literally real time with all of your daily activities. So this is where we're talking about tracking our stress trends or our exercise and movement, our food intake and our sleep. And in the world of food, there's a variety variety of ways you can do this. You can actually just use freehand notes. You can take photos of your food or you can use their tracker. Um, so great ways to really get more specific information. And then NutriSense also provides with their team, personalized recommendations, check-ins and ways to support and improve your health. So NutriSense completely takes the guesswork from the equation. And since you get to see your personalized responses to all of these elements, instead of generic, you really get to move your health forward to the next level. You can purchase a CGM by visiting NutriSense.io. And, uh, when you use the code Ali RD, this will give you, uh, access to $30 off a monthly subscription plan. Also, when you go to my URL, which will be linked in the show notes, if you scroll to the bottom there, um, it's just backslash Ali Miller RD NutriSense.io slash Ali Miller RD. 
on that landing page, you are able to scroll all the way to the bottom and do just a one-time use meter for $175 instead of committing to a subscription. However, I will say if you're nerdy, like Becky and I, you're probably going to want to do it a couple of times. Uh, so you can go on over to NutriSense.io slash Allie Miller RD and get started. All right, let's get back into Should we do it. alcohol before we yeah. move on. Yet? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's always a really interesting point. And I know for both of us who consume wine pretty regularly, it was definitely something within the last 14 day experiment that I did, um, that I noticed some variability of, you know, type of alcohol, um, whether it was consumed with a meal, yes, how late I was having it and what my sleep trends looked like the night before, but let's just talk alcohol and kind of what trends you've seen in, in, um, individuals. Yeah. And, and just like the caffeine, it is variable. And, and like you mentioned, there are a lot of moving pieces that are going to have, uh, an impact on your response to alcohol, but kind of as a general rule of thumb, what we see is that of course, the more carbohydrate containing alcoholic beverages, like, uh, sugary cocktails, or maybe a darker beer or a dessert wine, we're usually going to see that glucose spike, like you might expect, but often for the lower carbohydrate containing wines, like dry wines or liquor, uh, they usually don't have as much of an immediate effect on glucose. You know, people are usually expecting something crazy to happen when they drink. Right. Uh, and a lot of times we see kind of stable glucose values in the moment and maybe even a glucose dip. Right. So sometimes that can have a little bit of that glucose lowering effect. Um, and then for many people, we might even see a more pronounced dip later. So a couple hours later, sometimes in the middle of the night, if you're sleeping, um, really, this is just because the body is going to prioritize breaking down that alcohol over basically everything else, right? right. Uh, technically a toxin. So our body is going to do, uh, what it's got to do to break down the alcohol and remove it from the system. And so sometimes this can take precedence over normal glucose homeostasis that comes on in the liver. Um, so for some people, maybe two or three drinks, and they might see a more pronounced dip while they're sleeping. And it might even wake them up for a lot of people. We see this non-diabetic nocturnal hypoglycemia from too much alcohol. Uh, and another thing that can happen, usually if you're tipping the balance of maybe one too many drinks is that often we'll see higher glucose values the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, there is research to suggest that this is likely due to just kind of that impairment in the normal liver glucose homeostasis. And so the next day we might be a little bit less insulin sensitive. So sometimes people will see a higher baseline value the following day and then higher uh, glucose responses to their normal go-to meals. Um, but again, uh, dose makes the poison and it is variable from person to person. So one glass of wine for somebody might see no response at all. Um, maybe even a little bit of that glucose lowering without any of the negative hypoglycemic or yeah, response the next day. Whereas for other people, they might be a little bit more sensitive and see a response even from, you know, one glass where some people that threshold is maybe two or three, um, and of course the quality is, is going to matter too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so funny. It's like almost opening the same Pandora's lid of nuances of food choice yep. because of microbiome, because of genetic variability, you know, we can see individuals that are getting that hypoglycemic dip. That's quite aggressive where they're waking yeah. up with the sweats and, you know, kind of shaky, anxious as well. And then there's a refractory blood sugar surge again, probably duly impacted by that adrenaline epinephrine response, um, and cortisol playing a role there as well as their bodies, um, you know, actual blood sugar response. And for some I've seen like champagne in individuals that, uh, have candidiasis or candida overgrowth or yeast intolerance. And then they eat something that's, or drink something that's higher yeasty and they get a much more dynamic blood sugar spike than the quantity of drinks or said amount of alcohol. And, and it might be more about the type of beverage itself. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing to consider is just that impact it might have on sleep. You know, if you're 
drinking right before bed and then going to sleep, it can impair the quality of sleep that you'll have, which will then also have an effect on your glucose values the next day. So those are pretty interconnected, which is why usually trying to have, if you are going to have a, a glass or two of alcohol, kind of that drier wine, I'm having it maybe more with dinner and not right before bed or um, giving yourself some time to break it down a little bit before you are trying to go into sleep. Yep, totally. Um, so lots to consider there. Um, let's talk about, um, well, we've, we've walked listeners through, um, prior, like how to actually put on the meter and, and kind of the process there. And we also have actually a YouTube video where we show how to do it. So we don't need to go through that process. I don't calibrating think. Um, and, and yeah. calibration, but let's maybe talk about just some of the common, um, areas of, of concern to troubleshoot or like things that might interfere with the accuracy of results. Um, I know we've gotten the question of like, can I go swimming? Can I go in the sauna? Um, so let's talk about those things, heat, um, Direct sunlight. exposure, sunlight, and then anything else that you've seen to interfere with accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. So we get the question that you mentioned often about swimming, um, sauna, even showering, working out. So all of those things, you can do all of those normal activities with the sensor on, um, especially kind of the day-to-day activities. So showering, um, working out, all of that is perfectly fine. It will stay on there. You know, it has that kind of adhesive sticker and it's, it's pretty resilient. Um, and so you can do those normal activities with swimming. We do provide uh, a bandage. So it's just kind of like a cover to put over it. And if you do have that bandage on, you can swim for up to 30 minutes and it'll be okay. Um, so for some people, you know, we've had some triathlon athletes who are swimming for four hours a day and open water, and that might not work so well. So if you're doing a lot of long swimming, um, probably want to time it in a, in a wear it in a time that you're not doing as much swimming, um, with sauna, it should be fine. Should stay on perfectly well, even through all the sweating and the high temperatures, but that really extreme high temperature can cause a glucose spike. Um, and there's kind of twofold reason for that. And this can also go for really hot temperatures outside in general, if you're outside for a prolonged period of time. Um, one is just that the sensor has kind of operational, temperatures that it works best at. So really high heat, it might not work as well during that moment, but it won't break the device. So once you get back into normal temperature, it's going to work perfectly fine again. Um, and the other is we do see, you know, there's research done of measuring glucose values while in a sauna and our glucose does increase a little bit. And again, this isn't a bad thing. This is mostly due to just kind of fluid distribution, a little bit of dehydration, Um, and that kind of, uh, it's almost like a workout, right? Our glucose does rise sometime during exercise, especially if it's more intense. Um, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we do know that glucose rises a little bit in sauna. And so there's kind of the compound effect there of the temperature and the actual physiological response that's occurring. Um, another thing that we get asked about often is kind of cold therapy. Um, yeah. Yeah. And all of that is, is perfectly okay as well. Same thing as the sauna or the hot temperatures. If it might be outside of the operational temperature range and you might see either no glucose data during that or a weird response, but it will function just as normal once you're kind of back into a normal temperature range. Yeah. I know I had my daughter at farm camp in Texas (laughs) Texas. <laughs> and so it was like literally 101, you know, outside. And I was in pretty direct sunlight. And so it was reading high. And I, I just took a finger stick to like verify, like, eh, I, I've told clients, I'm like, it's kind of like when your cell phone overheats, if it's like literally baking in the sun when you're pool. Yeah, exactly. You have to like put it in the shade. So you kind of have to put your body in the shade, let everything mellow out. Um, and and I think just using a finger stick to troubleshoot those little nuances is the best way to confirm. And then you could just make a data point and make a note, like was outside, you know, not a technical trend that I'm, and, and I haven't had anyone calibrate for that because exactly the meter seems to once you're even 15 minutes, um, in the air conditioning and you take, take another finger stick, it's right in alignment with what your CGM is saying, but there's just those short-term kind of overheating yep. function things. Exactly. And the one other thing that will cause kind of what we call false spike, um, is high dose vitamin C supplements. 
Uh, so usually it takes at least a, a thousand milligrams of vitamin C to see a spike in response to this. And this actually, you'll likely see this for almost all glucose meters as well. It is an interaction with uh, the enzyme reaction um, in the device itself. So it's not a true glucose response again, um, but it's kind of this fake spike. It's just a uh, an interference with the devices. So that's another thing to consider. If anyone has seen, uh, if they're getting like the IV vitamin C, we'll see that and the glucose will go up to like 800. Um, that is not real. So don't panic. And that's just at one dosage. Cause I'm just like thinking, I'm like, Oh, yep. our right, people take right. 1.2 grams, like two different 600 milligram dosages, but they're usually separated six hours, four hours. Minimum. Yeah. And we I don't typically, yeah, we don't typically see that glucose response right. unless it's yeah. The, the thousand milligrams in a single sitting. One. Yep. Okay. yep. Okay. Good to know though. Yeah. Um, Cause that can for sure happen. All right. Um, maybe let's round out. I know there, um, has been a little bit of, of, I've seen pushback on the CGM world of things. And, and I think it's a fantastic tool from my perspective of empowerment with data. Um, but there has been a little pushback of like too much data collection or maybe an unhealthy obsession with numbers. If you're non-diabetic or that non-diabetic shouldn't be using CGMs and, and only diabetic should, um, what are your thoughts? there. Yeah. Um, obviously I'm in the camp that I think the CGMs are a really beneficial tool, but, um, there's really two arguments to unpack there. One is the kind of obsession with data too much can be too much for some people. And I think that is completely valid. Um, so this might be the type of person who has a history of anorexia Mm -hmm. or extreme restriction, Um, and this is a real thing. And I don't think that this is necessarily a good fit for that person, but we wouldn't even really recommend any type of tracking for that individual. Um, maybe food tracking, macro tracking, I really wouldn't recommend. Um, so I think that is true for all data components, data streams is, is that as a type of individual, I wouldn't recommend it for. And we actually do screen for history of, um, kind of anorexia in, there's actually interestingly a lot of literature and positive responses we're seeing with those who've had history of binge eating disorder. Um, cause it can actually help a lot of clinics now eating disorder clinics are using CGM as a therapeutic therapeutic tool for a binge eating disorder. Mm-hmm. Um, of course we are not an eating disorder clinic, so we are not um, treating eating disorders at NutriSense, but uh, it, there is an interesting connection there where it actually might be a useful tool for that specific subset. Um, and then there's the second argument of that CGMs should not be used for people who are non-diabetic. Um, there's a couple different reasons trains of thoughts that people have with this one is from the type one community. And a lot of the pushback is that these devices are already expensive for them. Um, insulin is expensive for them. And now more people are going to be using them and, and limiting access to them. And I think it is a valid fear that is coming from a place of frustration and fear. Uh, of course, CGMs are a life-saving device for type one diabetics. Like truly every type one should be wearing these and have access to CGMs without having to pay out of pocket. Um, but the more that demand there is for CGMs, then that will actually help make it more affordable for everyone. So, um, there's really not a true issue of kind of, there's like this limited supply of CGMs. Trust me, the manufacturers would be very happy that the more they they sell that they will be okay with that. There's not like a supply issue. Um, And then, you know, there was a pushback where there was a JAMA opinion article that came out about arguing that CGMs were not needed for non-diabetics. And their point of view was that they are complicated and don't provide any additional insight from what you could get from a fasted glucose or hemoglobin A1C. And it sounds like you guys have used it with clients. So you probably know that's not necessarily true. Just like we mentioned the two extreme examples of one where somebody has a normal A1C and normal fasting glucose and abnormal CGM values. So, you know, daily excursions up to 200 sometimes, um, really high glycemic variability, but it's not yet crossed the threshold into pre-diabetic levels on the traditional markers. Right. And then I also see the other example that we mentioned where maybe somebody is 
you're full of carbohydrates are very restrictive. They have a poor relationship with food and this becomes a more liberating device for them to have this information. So I really think that first step is, you know, awareness. You need to have the right tools and right information to know where to focus. And, um, I don't believe that the tools we have of just an A1C or fasting glucose gives us enough true information to be able to make some of these nuanced decisions. So that's one of the main reasons. And the other, I would just say is that prevention is always better than treatment. (laughs) The earlier we can become aware of yellow flags before they become red flags, the better, you know, we have so many people living in this country and across the world that have prediabetes, diabetes, metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, the more we can identify people who are having this dysregulation and the sooner we can pick up these abnormal trends the better. Uh, so the more I I get frustrated when with this JAMA opinion article, because I feel like it's one step forward, two steps back where we're like, okay, people are starting to become aware that if I tackle these things earlier, it's better. Um, and then they're saying, no, you, you know, you just need to check your A1C once a year and that's it. We see so many people who come to us and I'm sure you experience this as well, where, you know, they're like, oh, I just got an A1C that's pre-diabetic. And my doctor told me to, eat better and wash it and we'll check it next year. And that's all they got, you know, and it's like brushed off. Like it's not important. And they're like, and I was doing some research and I really like actually want to do something about this. And, um, and that's exactly the people that we want to help. You know, we need a good foundation of good metabolic health if we want to have a healthy society. So I believe this is a tool that can help achieve some of those goals. And again, just like we mentioned, everyone has unique responses. It's really hard to know that level of personalization without the right data. And I finally, you know, as we have already mentioned, it really drives behavior change. We can tell people what to do until we're blue in the face, but unless they feel motivated to do it and they see it's working, they see it's important. uh, If they don't actually do it, then we haven't gotten anywhere. You know, we're, we're not making real change and any sort of tool that helps reinforce and drive those healthy habits we know are important, but sometimes are easy to let slip is a win across the board, whether you're diabetic or non-diabetic. Totally. And I mean, our audience and our clients are always looking at optimize and thrive, not survive. And exactly. inarguably there is harm to elevated glucose levels. As we talked, you know, you mentioned oxidative stress impact and, you know, damage to our vessels and so much more. And so we don't want to just overshadow someone that has a 5.2 A1C and say all is well, when we know that we could help them take it next level in their experiential health as well, as well as their physiological health. So we find it to be a really powerful tool for that reason. So I think always important to get the information as long as you have a good team to help you interpret it and you feel empowered by it versus frustrated and confused and overwhelmed. But, you know, I mean, JAMA also says all foods fit in some opinion pieces. (laughs) We would totally have issues with that too. Like, I'm sorry, no one should be eating chemical shit storms of Pepsi and Cheetos. I don't care. Yep. Um, So, you know, there's all that. There's always those ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Exactly. And and that's also part of the reason that we do include dietitians on staff to help people um, because we do know, you know, the data can be overwhelming. There's a lot of moving variables. There's a lot of things to consider. And we don't want people walking away with a, you know, the wrong takeaways or B, you know, thinking that they need to have this flat glucose line. They have to remove everything. They need to be perfect. So I really believe in that perfect melding of human expertise and data as that sweet spot. And I think you need both. Yes. I love that. And, and let's close out. Maybe this has been an awesome conversation. We could talk to you for ages, I'm sure, but, um, let's close out with, um, just what support people can expect to have along the way and, and anything else you want to tell them about the process of purchasing their meter or, um, anything else that you want our listeners to know. Yeah. And even some of my clients were, um, with everything with medical freedom right now, yeah. uh, we're like, Oh wait, so I have to scan in my driver's license. Oh, yeah. So maybe let's just talk through like the logistic elements of like, okay, you go to the URL <laughs> slash Allie Miller D you purchase the meter and what happens? Yep. Yeah. So this is considered a medical device in the United States, um, which is another, you know, frustrating component is that people who want this historically have had a really hard time getting it because you need a prescription. Um, so we take care of all of that headache, all of that legwork for people. All you have to do is sign up on our website through the, you know, your URL, as you mentioned, um, pick the plan you want. They really just differ of how long you want to do it for. We have a 
month to month, no commitment option, but you could also commit for longer and it'll be cheaper. If you know, you know, you have some work to do, or maybe you have a uh, prediabetes or PCOS or something where, you know, you need to lower your glucose. Uh, so you'll pick your plan and then, yeah, to sign up, you just fill out a he- quick health questionnaire and you do need to scan in your driver's license. And this is just to send to our physician network and they will write a prescription so we can get this device and then we'll ship it to your door. So, um, you don't have to go anywhere, do anything. It will come to you. And then you can just put the devices on at home. As you mentioned, it's really easy, painless to put them on. And then you just use our phone app to see the data, chat with your dietitian. Um, you know, scan the CGM, all of that comes from the app that we have. And then every 14 days, the device is expiring. You just peel it off like a band aid. you know, toss it in the trash and put on the next one. If you have another one, um, and as a po- as regards to the support of what to expect. Um, so they are all registered dietitians on staff and, um, they have all been trained under me. So they are not necessarily following the traditional dietetics guidelines. So no fear. They're not going to tell you to follow the, my plate recommendations, Just eat more carbs. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your insulin dose where it is and eat more carbs. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just do that sliding scale and you'll be okay. Um, but no, so the, they'll work with you to kind of figure out where you might need some improvement, or they might just help you interpret the data. If that's what you need, it's really, you can make what you want from the support for some people. It's just to help, you know, understand that glucose component. What does this response mean? How can I make this one better? And for others, they might use it a lot more heavily of really helping, um, provide meal ideas, you know, intervention recommendations. So, uh, it it really depends on where someone's at in their journey and how much they want to lean on that support. Um, but it is there for whoever might need it. And we'll also reach out proactively to check in, kind of point out some trends we're seeing in the data to just make sure that we're all kind of on the same page and things are being understood. Yeah. I've seen really thorough email summaries that my clients will forward to me that they get from your team, which is super helpful. And then for listeners, if you aren't an active client of the naturally nourished clinic, you, and you want to add some functional medicine layers into that, or really want to tweak supplement adjustments and such. That's something that you could always do like a three pack of 20 minutes with Becky and do that more like Q and a style upload. What we generally do in our clinic is we have you just dump your screenshots of your line graphs into like a Google doc or a running email. And then we can kind of unpack that with you and, and troubleshoot or address with, you know, how many milligrams of berberine, or again, what, what are we working for as our stress strategy and so much. So it can definitely be paired beyond the logistic understanding. If you wanted to take that next level. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Kara. We will put absolutely the links in the show notes. And I think that this is a really important conversation to have and such a powerful tool for all of our listeners to have access to. So thank you for all of the great work that you're doing over with NutriSense. Yeah, absolutely. It was a pleasure speaking with you both. Thank you for listening to the Naturally Nourished podcast. Visit our blog at AllieMillerRD.com for recipes, wellness tips, and food as medicine meal plans. Connect with Allie and Becky at AllieMillerRD on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, stay nourished and be well.